start this meeting off um, with this reflection. The higher purpose of my life is not the song and dance or the acclaim, but to rise up, to pull up others, and leave the world and industry a better place. Viola Davis. So I thought that this would be a really good place to start since I think that's kind of the work that we're trying to do for Bang and um, all the other CAGs. So um, with that said, I'm going to hand it back off to Callan. Thank you. So um, today we would like to continue our Black History Month with our Black Health Matter series. And um, that's been our theme for this month, right? And during our first presentation earlier this month, we had drblacks.com. And for those that did not have the opportunity to attend, I assure you it will be time well spent. I will go ahead and drop that link in our chat. That way, if any of our community partners want to check that out, they'll be able to um, check out that presentation. So I'll drop that in there. And um, sorry, I got a little delay here. There it goes. So, um, but today, today's session is going to be focused on COVID-19. Uh, in December, during our BANG membership meeting, we did an unofficial poll and we pretty much asked if the vaccine was available, would you get it? And during that time in December, based on our responses, we had one individual that indicated that they would get it. And we know that getting the vaccine is a very personal decision. And what we wanted to do as Bang was to provide an opportunity for our membership and our community partners to hear about the vaccine, uh, have the opportunities to ask questions in a safe environment. This is going to be open. We're going to have time for you to ask questions uh, from, from one of our trusted providers. And our mission today is really helping folks make an informed decision, right? Either way. Uh, make sure you know all the facts going in. And, and if we accomplish that today, this would be a successful meeting. We know it could be uncomfortable to ask questions, so uh, we welcome you to put questions in the chat. When offered the opportunity, you can come off mute and ask questions of our, our guest speaker. But if you are uncomfortable in asking any questions, uh, you, can, you can email Sahara Jones. I'm going to put her email in the chat. Uh, and we can get those questions answered anonymously. Um, it's S. Jones 6 at Peace Health. And uh, today, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker. Uh, this speaker is part of the Peace Health family, uh, extended Bang family member. Uh, he is known for his commitment to evidence-based care, respect to, to respect to respect towards fellow caregivers, also compassion towards his patients, uh, he's the ultimate ally. Uh, this particular individual proactively reaches out to us and says like, hey, bang, I'm here. What can I do to help? And we we admire him tremendously. Uh, like President Bill Clinton, uh, actor Bradley Cooper, uh, first ballot Hall of Famer Alan Iverson. Uh, he attended Georgetown University. He received his uh, medical degree uh, from that fine institution. Um, I'd like to welcome our speaker. He is the chair of Peace Health Southwest Emergency Department, Dr. Raymond Lee. Well, hello, um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, and thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, I wish we, we could do this in person, but uh, you know, uh, but I'm just excited to be here. So, and one more shout out to you. If you have not checked out Dr. Blackstock's uh, lecture, it is definitely an hour and a half worth your time. It was just a really enlightening and uh, and she's just such a dynamic speaker, so um, please check that out. So let me just share my screen, because um, I think instead of having an open session for an hour where I sort of answer questions, I think it would be more helpful for me to sort of go through maybe a 30, 35 minute presentation. I think most of us are gonna share about 90% of the same 10 questions. 
And, and my purpose, I think, is do that. We can address majority of the questions in depth, and then we'll leave some time at the end uh, for 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 a conversation. Let me just share my screen here. Can you see my screen at all? Yes, it looks blank though. It's almost we we could see it though. It's like your whiteboard. Okay. Let really. me, okay, let me try that again. Share. <clears throat> Excuse me. How is that? There you go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Very good. All right. We'll we'll get this. Perfect. All right. Now, so you can see it and you can hear me. Yes. Yes. You are yes. all good to go. Good. Well, um, so you know, feel free to sort of type in questions in a chat box, and I, if Sahara or Conan, if you can just sort of keep an eye on it and sort of moderate. Uh, the questions and discussion because I, I still want us to be as participatory as possible. Um, so, so I think just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I grew up in Taiwan and immigrated to the States when I was 13. I went to high school in Northern California, went to Cal Berkeley for uh, college and got myself a music degree. Took a couple of years off. Um, and before going to medical school at Georgetown, and I did my emergency medicine residency at, o at OHSU, I fell in love with the Pacific Northwest and decided to stay. And uh, I have two children. I have a 13-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl. They're very tired of not being able to have sleepovers, but uh, they're resilient, and sometimes they're surprisingly gracious about my very strict COVID rules. And so professionally, as, as you know, I, I'm an ER doc. I also am currently serving the second of my two year term as chief of staff there. And I work in the busiest ER between Salem and Seattle. I see and take care of COVID patients. I've seen the suffering of not just the patients themselves, but, of, but also the families and just the emotional toll this pandemic has had on my staff and my colleagues. And the community. So early in the pandemic in March, one of the stories that circulated widely among ER docs was about a young ER doc in Seattle who caught COVID. He almost died. He was put on a ven ventilator for a long time at, and at one point was so near death that he was put on an ECMO machine, which is a life and lung support machine as a last ditch effort to save his life. He survived, but barely. And this story terrified me from the very outset of the pandemic. So in March, my wife and I sat down and made sure that our wills was updated. I made sure my wife had access to all the passwords, including Netflix, very important. And I accepted the very real possibility that caring for total strangers doing my job could kill me. And for the first time in my life, I experienced nighttime anxiety. And I was even more terrified of infecting my family. So to this day, when I come home after a shift, I go straight through the back door down to the basement. I strip everything down to my underwear and socks and I run straight to the shower to, de to decontaminate before I see my family. It's a routine I've kept since the, the pandemic started a year ago. And it's pretty silly and more superstition by now, but I, you know, I figure it's worked. I'm not going to change anything. And I'm a lot less scared about dying from COVID now and much of it has to do with receiving the vaccine. 
So just uh, to be clear, I have no financial conflict of interest. I don't have any disclosures to, to uh, disclose. So I think we need to be very clear and sober about where we are with COVID and what COVID has done to in this country. So this is the latest data today, right? So, and the good thing is that the cases and hospitalizations are going down, but you can't ignore the fact that more than 28 million tested positive, and, and I'm sure much more have been infected and over 500,000 dead. I mean, those are astounding numbers. And let's not remember, it was only a month ago that we had a tragic January, right? Again, this is sort of Washington Post did a nice sort of story uh, on January, right? An average of 3,100 people in the United States died of the coronavirus each day in January. That's a 9-11 every day. It's one every 28 seconds. So the suffering was immense. Right. And not only are Americans dying from COVID, and for the first time, our life expectancy is lowered because of it. And the last time this happened was during the Spanish flu in 1918. Right. So the headline American life expectancy fell by one year to 77.8%. And what is even more disturbing is that the black communities are affected disproportionately. Life expectancy of the black population declined by 2.7 years in the first half of 2020, slicing 20 years of gain. And the life expectancy between black and white Americans is now six years, the widest that has been since half compared to white Americans, and even less for Latinx communities, right? This is why this is, I think there's some sense of urgency to see how we can best achieve equity. And, and just one thing I'll say about any sort of racial disparity data is that they are not stories about race. They're stories about racism. Race is not the reason for poor outcome, but racism is. And these disparity data reflect both the systemic and interpersonal racism in this pandemic that this pandemic has exposed and amplified. All right, so before we get to the vaccine itself, uh, I think it's useful to just have an idea of how the coronavirus infects a host. So it, it attaches to the host through these little prickly projections called spike protein. And, and immunity comes when our body can produce antibodies that can bind and block the spike protein, basically neutralizing the virus. All right, let's get to the number one questions that people come up and, and talk to me about. Uh, which is, this vaccine came too fast. Important safety steps were skipped. And this is a very legitimate question, but I, I think let, let's break it down together and understand why the vaccine was able to happen so quickly. So, so the first thing you should know is that the speed of the COVID vaccine development is a reflection of the science and vaccine technology and just the 
ridiculous amount of money and energy that went into it. The speed did not come at the expense of safety. The process was fast, but safety and quality checkpoints remained and they were not skipped. And I want to show you how. So I, I think the most effective way is to just compare traditional vaccine development and COVID vaccine development side by side. So we understand what is different and more importantly, how these differences make sense and are, are not at expense of safety. So just look at this, right? So this is an article from Nature, and, and which along with this journal called Science, they're the two most pre prestigious science journals. So traditional vaccine is a, is a lengthy process, right? Steps happening in sequence, as you can see, and can take many years to develop. So it starts with the, the exploratory work of research and development of vaccine design. And this phase can take years. And this is followed by preclinical phase to establish safety on animals. Then a series of clinical trials on human. You have phase one, small, to establish dose and safety. You have phase two, larger, to establish efficacy and more safety. And lastly, the very, very, very costly phase three trial. Large clinical trials to compare people who received the vaccine versus people who did not to assess how well the vaccine works. Then you have the FDA approval process. And after approval, you still got to make the vaccines. And all these steps are happening in sequence. And this is really important. Each step takes time and money. And because of the cost, the entire process is slowed by economic risk investment at every step. So it's not surprising that traditional vaccine can take 10 or more years to develop. The last vaccine before COVID was four years. Now, let's just see how COVID vaccine development differed. So they're different in four important ways. One, is we have a strong foundation of knowledge from prior coronavirus pandemics and vaccine development. COVID vaccine didn't start from scratch. It wasn't just sort of thrown together uh, in March. Uh, that's important to remember. And second is just the fact that the mRNA technology is pretty elegant. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And third is that steps happened in parallel rather than in that can save a lot of time. Or, I think probably the most important is really just the power of the federal purse. And let's go through them. So first, so is, is the history and prior knowledge, right? So it's important to remember that COVID is not the first pandemic caused by a novel coronavirus nor the second. First was SARS in uh, 2002, and second was MERS in 2013, or 2012. And the reason we, the United States, have no strong memories of these two is because they barely hit us. We had few infections and actually no death, right? But both SARS and MERS which stand for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, were really deadly. MERS killed about a third of those infected. So for the scientists, when MERS happened, MERS was really alarming and ominous because it was the second deadly coronavirus pandemic in 10 years, right? And the third was not a question of if, but when. So guess what the scientists started doing after SARS? and especially after MERS. They went to work on a vaccine against the next coronavirus. But the world got very lucky twice. Both SARS and MERS just sort of petered out. And so did the money to fund the vaccine. But scientists laid an important foundation of the science 
to develop a vaccine specifically against coronavirus. So for example, because of the work that started with SARS and MERS, scientists knew right away to target the spike protein this time. And this knowledge saved a lot of time. So essentially, you can think of sort of the discovery phase, which can take years under normal circumstances, actually took no time at all. I mean, you can almost think of the COVID vaccine development as having started in 2003 after the first SARS pandemic 17 years ago. Second is the mRNA technology that the vaccine is based on. So first of all, this is not a new technology. Right? Scientists have actually been working on it for the last 20 years. And in fact, there has been already mRNA vaccines in small phase one and phase two clinical trials as early as 2017 for Zika, influenza, rabies, and other viruses. So we already have some existing efficacy and clinical safety data on mRNA vaccines. And second, was that an elegant feature of the mRNA vaccine is the speed with which we can use it to develop the vaccine. They're not grown in eggs or cells. They can actually just be synthesized quickly in test tubes and labs. All you need is the genetic sequence of the virus and know which protein to car target. And you know which protein it is. It is that spike protein. On January 10th, a Chinese scientist posted coronavirus's genetic code online. Within a day, the scientists had a design of the protein they would use for the vaccine. So in January, seven days before the first recorded United States case of coronavirus, we had a blueprint for the vaccine. And within six weeks, on March 16th, we have the actual, actual vaccine doses ready for clinical phase one trial. And this gets to my third point is that things were happening in parallel rather than in sequence. And, and this saved a lot of time, right? Productions for hundreds of millions of doses began at the same time the clinical trials were being conducted. So hopefully this sort of gets at the questions about um, why it came fast and that these the reasons that we talked about are starting to sort of make sense, right? They, I think they're good reasons. They're not nefarious reasons. Um, so the next question I hear a lot is um, also an understandable question. You know, the drug companies are just out for profits and pushing the vaccines to make money. Well, well, yes, you, you bet they are they care about profits. But I, I think it's more helpful to think of this and to understand this in terms of just the power of the federal dollars. Again, because I think the biggest factor that the accelerated vaccine development was because of just the enormous amount of money that went into it. And as you know from our last discussion, traditional vaccine development is super expensive and can be financially very risky. But this time, the drug companies assumed little or no financial risks. The government and the PAC taxpayer did. So, you know, enter Operation Warp Speed, which I, I think is just kind of a silly and terrible name. It, it gives people the wrong impression that speed is everything. But I, I think give credit where it's due, this federal initiative to accelerate vaccine development was a success. It was a lone bright spot on our otherwise pretty disastrous federal response to COVID. And the reason the drug companies were able to move so fast was because the financial risks usually associated with vaccine development were assumed by the government, right? So the federal government handed Moderna almost $500 million to develop and manufacture vaccines and spent billions more to buy hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines from both Moderna and Pfizer. They bought the doses even before the vaccines were proven effective. 
and this allowed hundreds of millions of doses to be in production early and ready to go once the clinical trials can prove its safety and efficacy. And, and, and the Nature article we talked about earlier agreed with this, and the article stated, and I quote, it is very important to point out that moving forward at financial risk is the main factor that has, an en that has enabled the accelerated development of the vaccine candidates, and no corners have, have been or should be cut in terms of safety evaluation. And also just, you know, I think keep in mind that drunk, drug companies have, have nothing to gain but much to lose by just rushing to produce an unsafe vaccine. And we're going to even go into a little bit more detail. Let me just sort of show you the timelines of how these two vaccines came about. So the Pfizer vaccine, right, like I said, it began their work in January once they had that genetic code. In March, they started clinical phase one of phase two trials. In July, we started phase three trials. And the reason they were able to get so many people was that, I mean, there were just so many people getting infected. There was no problem recruiting sort of candidates. And July 2nd, Pfizer received almost $2 billion contract from the government to buy 100 million doses. And December 9th, it was approved in Canada. December 11th in the United States and quickly in Europe. And Moderna followed a very similar timeline. Started in January, March clinical trials, and in April, and this is the, the sort of the $500 million I, I mentioned earlier from the government to actually develop the vaccine. And July, to start a phase three clinical trial. Again, in August, the government's uh, contracted for another 1.5 billion from, for, for millions of doses, approved in the, US, in the United States in the 18th, Canada later, and quick soon after Israel. So, so I, I think, you know, the, the federal purse is an incredible powerful force and money moves and a lot of federal dollars can move things very quickly and motivate powerful institutions to do the right things. And just to give you an idea of just the enormous power of the federal purse, I want to take a little detour and give you a historical analogy. So let me tell you about the desegregation of American hospitals in the 1960s. Right. So in June of 1964, the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And this law prohibits the provision of any federal funds to organizations or programs that engage in racial segregation or other forms of discrimination. And specifically Title VI, which spelled out, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the grounds of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. But the problem was when the Civil Rights Act first came out, Title VI had no teeth when it came to hospitals. A gap persisted between the law and the hospitals, that is, until the passage of Medicare a year later in July 1965. Now, with Medicare, all of a sudden, the, that clause, federal financial assistance in Title VI, became something real, very real, as in a giant pile of federal money real for hospitals. So now, in order for hospitals to participate in Medicare and Medicaid, they need to comply with federal law. So the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965 completely altered the federal government's leverage on health care. And how important was this? In 1967, the first full year of operation, nearly 50% of the hospital revenues flow from Medicare and Medicaid. This is now becoming an immense new funding stream, right? 
And for a lot of hospitals, Medicare money was a choice between affluence and survival, and in some cases, bankruptcy. And guess what the hospitals chose? They chose affluence over bankruptcy. So in the first full year, hospitals received $5.6 billion from Medicare and Medicaid. Right? And, and the power of the federal purse was dramatic within four months of Medicare almost 3,000 hospitals desegregated, right? So for COVID vaccine development, Congress approved $10 billion for it. No other vaccine development received anything close to that level of money and investment from the federal government. So let's talk about the vaccine itself. So how does it work? Well, so both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine works through this thing called mRNA mechanism that we talked about. So basically the mRNA acts like a set of instructions for your body to make the spike protein. So once the vaccine is injected, the mRNA is taken up by the cells near the injection sites, basically instructs these cells to make the spike protein. And then the spike protein uh, basically induces an immune response and helps your body produce antibodies to the spike protein. And afterwards, um, your body will just naturally degrade the mRNA in a matter of hours. So no life virus is involved and no genetic materials enter the nucleus of the cells. And these features, I think, contribute to the vaccine's long-term safety. So think of the vaccine as a set of instructions to teach your body to make the spike protein, which will then stimulate your body to make the antibodies against it preventing the COVID infection. I think this is just incredibly clever, and I'm just really grateful that, that there are scientists out there who can actually design and think and, and make something so elegant. So how effective is it? Well, so both vaccines are remarkably effective and far exceeding ex expectations. So this is the data from the Pfizer trial. Um, the, the blue line are, is the placebo group. As you can see, the infection rate keeps going up, uh, extending all, all the way up until 16 weeks. And if you look at the, the vaccine group, it started to flatten up about a week and a half afterwards. After, that's not even after two doses. So this is incredibly... Um, effective. Uh, in fact, the data from both clinical trials was so strong because they're just the numbers are so overwhelming that you don't have to do any statistical analysis. That's how good the results were. And so and remember in the beginning when Dr. Fauci said he would be happy with the vaccine that's what 60, 70 percent effective. Well, both Pfizer and Moderna were about 95 percent effective. And just for comparison, the annual flu vaccine is about 40 to 60% effective. And not only do the vaccines dramatically lower your chances of getting infected, more importantly, the vaccines are remarkably effective at preventing severe disease, and they keep you from hospitalizations and dying from COVID. And let's just look at the numbers. So for the Pfizer, big study, over 40,000 patients, I mean, these are the size of the clinical trials that you can only dream of. So in the placebo group, 162 patients had COVID, 10 had severe disease. In the vaccine group, only eight had COVID, one had severe disease. And they concluded that it was 95% effective. Again, Moderna, also a lot of patients, in the placebo group, you had 185 patients had COVID, 30 had severe disease, and one died. In the vaccine group, 11 had COVID, zero had severe disease, and nobody died. It was 94% effective at preventing a severe infection. So, so after vaccine, your chance of dying from COVID, I mean, it's so low that, well, 
you're probably more likely to get in a car wreck or die in a car wreck. And if you're, you're a surfer, you, like me, you, you're more likely to get attacked by a shark. And you're probably even more likely to get hit by lightning than dying from COVID. I mean, that's how strong the data is in terms of efficacy. And, and that's why, to me, um, th- that benefits far outweighs, you know, sort of the small uncertainty with it uh, or the side effects um, that people can get from the vaccine. Right. And this is panning on the real world, fresh off the press. This is a, a report out of Scotland yesterday. Um, they basically um, found that the vaccine in the real world is, has been remarkably effective in preventing hospitalizations. So they looked at the Scottish population for 5.4 million and about 20% of the population, 1.1 1. 1 million have been vaccinated. And they compared the hospitalization rates of those to the rest of the population who have not been vaccinated. What they found was that in the unvaccinated group, about 8,000 hospitalizations hospitalization in the past two and a half months. And in the vaccinated group, there were 58. So, you know, I think this is really playing on the real world about its efficacy. Now, is the vaccine safe? And the short answer is yes. The short-term safety data is very good. And the clinical trials evaluated both efficacy and safety with equal rigor. And safety was a major focus in the clinical trials, and both mRNA vaccines have shown to be quite safe. But I think we have to accept that no vaccines, in fact, nothing in medicine is 100% safe. What side effects can you expect? So both of those vaccines are what we call reactogenic, meaning they are going to stimulate an immune response. Excuse me. And will cause side effects in most patients who receive them. And the most common side effects is pain at the injection site with pain and swelling. And there's this thing about, you know, about a week or so, they can have to develop swelling and redness later. And sometimes you can get swollen lymph nodes in the area. And then some com- some relatively common sort of systemic side effects are headache, fatigue, low-grade fever. Um, high-grade fevers can happen, but they're uncommon. And side effects in general are more common in younger recipients and after the second dose. And a lot of people are concerned about severe allergic reaction. And I want to put the risk in context. So first of all is that severe allergic reactions to the vaccines are rare. For the Pfizer vaccine, it's about five to six per million. For the Moderna, about two per million. So to put things in context, severe allergic reaction to penicillin is about one in 5,000. And the difference is that we hear about severe reaction to the vaccines in the news. We don't hear about the severe reaction to penicillins in the news. So put it another way, Pfizer vaccine is 40 times less likely to cause severe reaction compared to penicillin and the Moderna vaccine, a hundred times less likely. So here are some sort of common just misinformation, meaning they're just playing out wrong. Um, you know, first of all, as you understand by now, there's no life virus in the vaccine, so vaccine will not infect you with COVID. The antibodies will not cause infertility. And, and the, the mRNA never sort of enters the nucleus of the cells and never interact with the DNA. So that is also untrue. And last one is something that, that's been also circulated. Uh, you know, vaccines do not have microchips. And these are sort of just wrong information. But you should also be aware that there's 
disinformation out there, meaning there are deliberate campaigns. And unfortunately, it's specifically targeting minority communities, trying to dissuade the communities away from vaccine. And this is just a story over the weekend on NPR um, where they talk about that. And it's not new. Back in January, BBC did a story about misleading claims deliberately ta targeting ethnic minorities. As far back as in December, uh, again, national news, mistrust, disinformation on COVID vaccines among Latinos or Hispanic doctors. So just, you know, that you should be aware out there that there are forces out there uh, that are trying to, that are de deliberately trying to influence um, minority communities to uh, away from the vaccine. Another question that come up often is, you know, can I just wait? Well, well, there are reasons, there are good reasons not to do that. Um, so I think the most important reason is that hopefully you can you're convinced by now that the vac that immunization offers excellent protection, which again, COVID is a potentially life-threatening disease, has a much higher mortality rate than influenza, and young people can also get sick. Um, and in addition, some people who even have a moderate disease, they actually can have symptoms for months, and this is well documented, right? They can feel short of breath, have chest pains, palpitations, or have this brain fog that persisted and, and could be debilitating for months, right? It, it's, it's just a, such a great way to protect yourself. And second is that it will protect others, right? People with COVID-19 are highly infectious in the early phases of the illness and can transmit infections to others. By contrast, it is likely that vaccination will reduce the risk of viral transmission. You know, we can't conclude that immunization in eliminates the risk, which is why we still need to wear masks and do social distancing. The evidence strongly suggests that the vaccines will reduce the risk of transmission, making all of us safer. Third is now is it's now a race between humans and the coronavirus. I think in order for us to be protected as a population, about 75 or 80 percent of us need to be vaccinated and we need to do this as quickly as we can we're racing against the variants and against future variants right virus mutates it's normal to have variants and but the reason that the variants happened so rapidly was because there were so many infections worldwide Every infection was an opportunity for the virus to develop variants. And, and right now it's down to simple math. One more person protected is one less person to be infected by the variant strain. Lastly, the supply may be a limiting factor for a while, uh, although there were good news actually just today of both Pfizer and Moderna ramping up their uh, production. So when you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, it is a golden opportunity that may not present itself for a while. So you skip your turn and wait. It may turn out to be a very long wait. Lastly, I want to just talk about the issue of trust. Uh, I think we all know about the Tuskegee a study which was a four decade long uh, medical scheme, scheme starting in 1932 conducted by none other than the U.S. Public Health Services in which 400 black men with syphilis were led to believe that they were receiving treatment but were in fact left untreated so that the doctors could study and chart the course of the disease. And these men were not treated even when the cure penicillin became known. And I think understandably, 
this has become a central reference point for understanding Black Americans' relationship to medical institutions. Then there's Henrietta Lacks, a Black woman who died of aggressive cervical cancer in 1951, whose cancer cells were harvested for research without her knowledge and consent by Johns Hopkins Hospital. Her cells were replicated, sent to labs around the world, and later sold commercially. Her cells were immortalized, used by companies for research, including vaccine research, without her consent. Lastly is, is racism, I think both systemic and interpersonal. That exists, I think, virtually in all major institutions, you know, education, criminal justice, and healthcare system, right? So clearly, our nation and the medical system has a long way to go to address the trust issue and to bind up these wounds, particularly with Black Americans. But I think it is important to take a moment to acknowledge it, reflect on it, and respect it. And I think that's partly why I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity to be here today. And perhaps I can show you how COVID vaccine is different and perhaps can be trusted. So I think for starters, I think the vaccine research development parts and the clinical trials have been much more transparent, specifically with people of color and Black Americans involved at different stages of this process. And you may have already heard about Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. Uh, Dr. Fauci has talked about her quite often. She's a vaccinologist and a key scientist behind the success of the Moderna vaccine. And also just let me show you about the courageous people who participated in the two mRNA trials. Right? For the Moderna vaccine, um, about 20% Hispanic um, and also included a good size of non-white um, uh, participants, um, including 10% of Black Americans. And, and, and in both trials, they've done studies. The efficacy of the vaccine is the same in all the subgroups. Same with Pfizer, right? Again, uh, about 10% Black Americans and included other ethnicities. And it was, it was also multinational, it included uh, countries such as Argentina, Brazil, South Africa. And this is, I would say, the current state from Kaiser Foundation. In 26 states reporting data, the vaccination rate among white people is over three times higher than the rate for Hispanic people and twice as high as the rate for Black people. This is where we're at. And it is not surprising that there are so many prominent Black physicians and scientists who are really putting themselves out there to be advocates uh, for the vaccine. And I think uh, most of you or some of you will recognize Dr. Uche Blackstock, who, uh, like I said, gave uh, just a dynamic presentation um, this month. Um, she has a twin sister uh, who is also a physician, is actually an HIV specialist. They wrote this op-ed um, about you know vaccinations uh, and in inequity uh, in Black Americans, uh, clearly, I, I think they're advocating for vaccination. And also a recent op-ed uh, in the New York Times, right? In February, this op-ed was done by 60 Black American scientists and healthcare professionals, and this article started off by saying. We are among 60 Black members of the National Academy of Medicine, the premier health science organization in the United States. Together, we're scientists, doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals, and public health experts. We feel compelled to make the case that all Black Americans should get vaccinated to protect themselves. And they end the article reiterating that they're, you know, health professionals. I said, we understand the science, we understand our community. Many of us have already received the shots. The rest of us will get them. 
we're encouraged to, we encourage you to claim your place in line to get vaccinated. Do this for yourself. Do this for our community. We're asking you to trust us because we are part of you. So I think uh, a quick summary um, is that there are good reasons why the vaccines came fast. And these reasons were not nefarious or conspiracies. And second is that to the best of our knowledge, backed by transparent data, the vaccine is safe. And this vaccine is remarkably protective and effective. And hopefully that we can see that this is, again, not a Tuskegee. And sort of the big picture is that Blacks, Latinx, Pacific Islanders are dying more by being vaccinated less. And the lastly is time is now. So why did I get vaccinated? Well, I wanted to protect myself. I don't want to die from COVID. I wanted to protect my family. I didn't want to get infect my family. And I'm just so tired of them worry sick about me. I think in, in the first six months of the pandemic, my, my 10 year daughter would sort of give me the longest hug before I go to work. I know she didn't want me to go to work. And that was, was just really heartbreaking to me. And the third is I, I want to protect my patients, my community, and you. And lastly is that, you know, I believe in science and facts and, and the benefits of getting the vaccine in my consideration far outweigh the risks and uncertainty, right? I think uh, as President Obama said, you know, our, our destinies are bound together. Uh, and I, I think a vaccination is very, very much being part of that. And lastly, it's just, I want this madness to end. And vaccine is the best tool we have, along with masks. We need to do this together. So Peace Health received vaccines on 15th of December in 2020. And we were organized, prepared, and began vaccinating folks the next day. And I was the second person and the first physician to receive the vaccine. Um, it was a really emotional day. So what you can see is that how I struggle to keep my emotions in check. It was relief, it was anger, it was sadness, it was hope, all just sort of jumbled and mixed together. I wanted to cry, I wanted to hug my colleagues, and I thought it was important to lead by example and show people that if I'm going to recommend the vaccine, I would be the first to receive it. So James Baldwin is one of my favorite thinkers and writers. I, I think sort of no one writes with a sense of immediacy and truth as he does. Um, he says, there's never a time in the future in which we'll work out our salvation. The challenge is in a moment. The time is always now. So thank you so much for your time. This is a photo out of my upstairs uh, bedroom. And at the bottom is my email. Um, so please, you know, reach out to me. Um, any time you like, uh, questions, and uh, I will get back to you. And these are my sources. Dr. Lee. Uh, yep. Dr. Lee, thank you so much and for sharing your sources as well. Um, with the, the short time left, I want to make sure we have an opportunity to to get some of these these questions and that that people are popping in the chat. I'll hand it over to Sahara. I know she has one or two, and then I'll review some of the ones in the chat 
also team i know that we are scheduled to end at one um if dr lee is okay to hang on for a few minutes and those that have a little more time maybe we can extend this q a period maybe 10 minutes past the hour for those that have questions also i'm going to be stopping the recording now so it's a safe space for for anyone to ask any question you like but sahar i'll hand it over to you first because i know you've been getting some emails yeah so dr lee that was